Uh, yeah, welcome. Uh, so I'm going to go through some things. Um, the main sort of thread, really, in terms of talking about the social life of money is to share some thinking that's sort of been going along for probably nearly 15 years now um, around money and why money. Well, because sort of money is very important and one of the reasons why we don't actually live in a sustainable economy right now and because of a lot of blockages that we have around what we think money is and how it works, we don't actually come up with solutions that are sustainable to a lot of problems. So um, in terms of abundance, I'm a founder there. We are a crowdfunding company. We were one of the first to be created. Um, we are a finance company, first and foremost. We're regulated by, in the, by the Financial Conduct Authority. Um, we raise money to fund renewable energy projects across the UK and other forms of infrastructure uh, from ordinary people. Uh, so for us, ordinary is anyone that can invest five pounds, um, which currently is worth a bit less than it used to be, but um, five euros or five dollars. <laughs> um, and that, those projects are funded by, you know, in specific areas, um, so we'll raise money for a particular wind turbine, a solar park, biomass project or a company that's investing in renewables and each investment is discrete so as an investor you're choosing from each project you're not investing into a fund you're not investing into a, someone else to make decisions for you we're not a bank um, um, but we have a lot of the other regulation that goes around investment and banking so um, we created that not as bankers I'm not a banker I'm an anthropologist by training um, and by trade um, and I'd worked for quite a long time with financial institutions um, to help them understand what the world of money was, was like out there rather than the world of money that they experienced on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and that work to help create um, something called peer-to-peer -peer lending, which is now a multi-billion pound thing. Um, when we started out, we didn't necessarily know it was going to work. We had to come up with new ways of thinking about stuff and markets and all sorts of things to make it work. Um, but a lot of that was based in anthropology, not economics. Economics didn't have a view on peer-to-peer -peer lending, except that it wouldn't work. So um, there's that piece came out of that, that work. Um, and I helped create that company. It's a company called Zopa, um, who are now, they've done about 1.7 billion pounds worth of lending in the UK to individuals from individuals, so people just linking up between one another on a network, uh, a market a bit like eBay, um, and that's been very successful. Um, and then in 2008, 2009, about the time of the financial crisis, when we were really looking at the collapse of a lot of things we thought were true about finance, about economics, about markets, and actually also about sustainability, um, I s helped found a company, Abundance, which was really there designed to sort of fill a gap that we saw in the UK specifically um, for money to build small scale projects, the sort of community scale um, up to independent sort of developers, so um, maybe up to four or five million pounds, renewable energy projects that were needed because actually what was happening was you had big utilities trying to build big scale projects that were very hard to deliver. But the, the real benefit of renewables is it's distributed and sustainable and small scale, which of course the big utility companies didn't know what to do with that. Um, and the banks didn't know what to do with it. Most banks won't look at project finance unless it's less than more than 20 million pounds. So we had this big gap, um, which we reckon was worth about 60 billion in funding if we were going to meet our goals in terms of renewable energy generation in the UK. Now, since then a lot of things have changed. You know, in 2008-09 there was a feed-in tariff system that worked, there was an energy policy um, rather than what we have now. And Abundance has kind of lived through all of that. We've lived through the tariff cuts, we've, um, we've gone through the policy shifts, and we've stuck with the various developers that we've worked with in different ways to sort of help them shift their businesses and finance them. So now we've raised 20 million thereabouts. And alongside that, we've been working to develop the broader infrastructure of what we now understand as crowdfunding in the UK, although when abundance was created, it didn't exist as a word, really. Um, 
and that's a big industry now. Um, it's uh, globally the UK is the biggest market uh, for regulated crowdfunding. Um, the only market that's bigger is China, um, but that is a wild west of unregulated lending um, worth multi billions, um, which one day will blow up. Unfortunately, uh, when that happens, it's going to be quite catastrophic. But there's in the UK we've got a regulated framework. And so I've been involved pretty closely with putting together those, the laws that we needed, the regulation that we needed to grow and promote an industry that's got a new way of thinking about money. Um, so I'm going to talk through some of that. And then most recently, uh, as Philip was saying, I've been very, very busy working as abundance. I head up the marketing team and the, the PR team. So I work a lot in the media. If you read The Guardian and you wonder why Zoe Williams is writing about finance, it's because I've basically spent about five lunches with her, educating her about finance. <laughs> um, quite similar to how I'm going to talk to you today. And because actually The Guardian didn't feel comfortable writing about finance. That's not what they write about. Um, and so a lot of it is about giving journalists the confidence to talk about things. Um, but the other thing that I've been doing is working with Treasury to come up with the new Innovative Finance ISO, which is probably one of the biggest changes that we've had um, in, aside from pension freedoms in, in our financial services for a long time. So in a very short period of time really, uh, abundance has been going for four years, Zopa for 12 years. Um, we've become part of people's individual savings accounts, ISAs, which is the way the majority of people in the UK save and invest. Um, there are something close to 500 billion pounds invested in ISAs in the UK. About 80 billion goes into ISA every year. And it's getting more and more because actually the allowance that you can put in each year is going up um, higher than inflation. Um, and the government think it's important because it's about getting money in the real economy because banks aren't lending anymore to the real economy, they're only lending to things that are safe. Um, and ironically, therefore, George Osborne created the world's first green ISA. Um, and that's what Abundance will be doing from November the 1st, is selling the ability for people to invest directly into renewable energy through their ISA. Which is simple to say, but that's two years of hard work to get it to that point where we were trusted enough, we could come up with a legal framework that worked within ISA um, that allowed a new form of finance to deliver something that is much more mainstream. So rather than thinking about sustainability and environment and green investment as something which is relatively niche and therefore certain pages of The Guardian, um, possibly The Independent, um, when we talk about ISA, I'm bringing green investment into the, the world of The Telegraph and the world of The Times, which is where you have to, have to fight the fight, fortunately. It is no good preaching to the converted. Um, you have to take the brickbats of selling something green in the Telegraph, which, trust me, are not, not <laughs> uh, trivial. So that, that's where we are. So with Abundance, we're trying to change people's perceptions of a lot of things. Um, and we do exist at this intersection of um, two of the hardest markets to operate in, energy and money. Um, and then also, I'm also facing up to the media and how we talk about money, how we talk about investment. Um, so really what I wanted to go through today was a little bit of the story about the social life of money, unpack it and sort of share some of the insights that have come from spending a lot of time as an anthropologist studying money, which is not a common area for anthropology to look at. There are probably the number of anthropologists that sort of studied money for any length of time, you can count on the fingers of probably one hand. Um, anthropologists tend to be interested in other things. Um, one of the problems with money is, of course, it's mainly invisible. So even finding it is hard, um, studying it is even harder, and it's also studying it in a developed economy, studying in the UK, so your field site is not interesting, it doesn't involve foreign travel, um, which most anthropologists are in, anthropology for the foreign travel and the field site. So it's, I, I started my study in Boreham Wood, a very exciting place, um, Nuneaton, um, Oldham, I spent a lot of time in Oldham, um, finding where people's money is and how it works and trying to observe it. Um, so I was going to start out with a little exercise which normally I do with a smaller group than this. Normally I would do this with a group of six or seven people in maybe a focus group context. This is possibly the largest scale I've got everyone to do this. Um, and what I'm going to do is a little bit of a 
It's a little bit of a mind projection, just to get you into a frame of mind of thinking about money, because what I, will, what I would guess is that most of you have a view of money which is largely taken for granted. We don't often think about money in a way that is existential. We worry about having it, or not enough of it, but we don't often think about what it is. And we tend to assume that everyone else is using the same meaning of money when we talk about it. And this is why most couples disagree on everything, <laughs> because you've got different meanings of money. So, so if you, just for a minute, if you, um, everybody just close your eyes for a second. And if you're not in a lecture theatre anymore, you're in a corridor. Um, and you're walking down the corridor. And on your left is a door. And on that door is written a sign which says, <coughs> your money. I want you to go open that door and look around what's behind the door, what's inside there. It may well be, it could be a room, there could be sounds, there could be smells, there could be anything. Just wander around in there for a minute. Okay, those of you who haven't fallen asleep, <laughs> which has happened in focus groups. Um, so, can anyone, what did anyone see? What was, anyone want to go at the back? They, it was like a classroom, yeah. and my kids were playing. In right, there, okay. And uh, they just seemed to be part of the board. Right, good. <clears throat> anyone else? I see a uh, very small fish, mm -hmm. chairs and table. And uh, besides, there was a safe. Right. Excellent. Yep. I saw a fusty old library right. with um, lots of empty shelves and then yeah. sort of <coughs> money in, in various places at different sizes. Right. Excellent. Another back one. Uh, damaged environment and people doing things they don't want to do. Right. <laughs> <laughs> cool. At the back again. Um, a vault um, with lots of money and gold and right. notes and coins stacked up. Oh, over there. <laughs> so <laughs> not really, but actually the uh, landscape around us, the lake is picked the light, the nature and lots of people feeling uh -huh. free. Cool. Okay. I saw sort of video of the future earnings potential pension where my taxes are going, but but also possessions mm. in there. As well, right. like a moving thing. Moving, excellent. Right, thanks. Oh, but it comes from Parliament, says due to uh, animals grazing and being killed and eaten. <laughs> yeah, process of making it, good. Mine looked like Harry Potter's uh, thing in Gringotts Bank, you know, gold everywhere. Right, right. <laughs> I'm not going to make, there's no, there aren't necessarily cultural associations around this, but <laughs> sometimes there are differences across different countries. Sort of floating around generally, but kids, houses, scuba diving, equipment, and right. pound notes. Okay, so your, your one is the most common picture that people draw. Normally I get people to do that as a picture on a piece of paper, but I wasn't going to do that with 30 odd people. So um, the most common one is people draw their house, they draw their children, their family if they have it. Um, and then varying degrees of order and disorder around it. Um, and depending on our economic situation, so in the middle of the crisis, the most common picture was quite a negative one, probably summed up by a, a tap pouring into a sink that's going nowhere. Um, holes in the ground, if you have a mortgage, that will often appear. Um, and often sort of in a sense of juggling or mo money moving between different priorities, so on the move or in the future. Um, except when people are about to get married, in which case their money is incredibly ordered. <laughs> um, and, and you can sort of do a Darren Brown thing where even if they haven't announced it to the rest of their team, as I did to someone in you know, some group of colleagues, I said, oh, are you getting married to? And they're like, oh, yes. <laughs> 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 uh, but I hadn't actually told anyone yet, thanks for that. So. Um, so it does sort of talk to where you are in your life. It's not necessarily, you know, you can make, there are some 
Um, as a general rule, and I've done this in the US, they've had a more um, uh, money oriented in the sense of cash. It more relates to money. In the UK, houses in Russia, um, very fluid. They have three different types of money in Russia, black, white, and gray. Um, black is how you buy property, that's how you have to buy it off the mafia. White is your job, that you pay taxes. And gray is your second job, which pays your bills. So, you know, each place you go, you're going to find different types of money, different perceptions of money. But the key thing is that it's social. So most of our accounts of money, if you go and look in a textbook, will be economic. Um, four types normally, store of value, exchange. Um, you know, they are definitions of an objective or are trying to form an objective view of what money is, as if it was a universal good or commodity. Um, the experience of people using money is the opposite. It's entirely contingent. There is no universal money. I have to understand exactly your context before I can understand what this bit of money means to you and how you will use it. And that can change from one pot to another. So you were describing a different pots within a room. That's quite a common way that particularly women organize their money. And that's why you now see banks doing that. Because anthropologists, when they ask people, how do you organize the money? And they always come back with some form of pots or divisions, which make absolutely zero sense to a bank, by the way. Um, banks want to link up all your pots. Um, people like to keep them separate. Um, and one particular person was even, because they have that compartmentalized view, was able to take money that was actually their student loan and call it savings. So if they had a loan of minus 7,000 and savings for which they were going to use to buy a kitchen, plus 7,000 because they were actually quite frugal and hadn't spent the money during their degree. So they had 7,000 pounds of savings that had no source until I worked out it was a loan. So they called it savings. To a bank, that's nonsense. That's zero. Mm -hmm. To that person, it's seven thousand pounds. So we don't join up. We don't have this abstract view of money. Um, it isn't neutral. So how you come to make money matters. So um, and there's a, a well, it's a, it's a very good study in Sweden of money that was earned through prostitution. And in Sweden, you also have quite um, big welfare payments. And they found that the money from the welfare payment was being used to buy food and essentials. Money from prostitution was used to buy luxury goods. So they had a complete division. The idea that they would be profligate with all their money was not true. They were careful with the money that they, in their mind, had to be careful with and they spent the money that could easily come and easily go. And you see that with lottery winners. Um, whether or not you play the lottery or play the lotteries, winning the lottery is actually very stressful if you've never had money before. A rich person winning the lottery would be fine. If you've never had a million pounds, 10 million pounds in your life, and it arrives into your life, it's like a bereavement. Um, people go into mourning. Um, they have to be counselled, um, and you will get counselling. Ironically, you get it from Barclays Bank. I'm not sure <laughs> how that. How I, <laughs> but anyway, the Barclays Bank have a particular group of advisors who are very specialists with uh, widows and inheritance, and um, those same advisors are used to advise lottery winners because it's a similar experience. Your old life is dead, and you now have to create a new one. You have new responsibilities. So money. Having all that money creates a problem, which is you now have to do something with it. And they're terrified that they won't do the right thing. It becomes a moral dilemma. What do I do with this money? I've never had money where I had choice over how I use it. So how am I supposed to make those choices? What? I don't have any social norm for having 10 million pounds. I don't have any friends who have 10 million pounds. So perhaps that, you know, we, should, we should shed a tear for Philip Green. It's, you know, it's tough being suddenly wealthy. That's why he's a psychopath. So, um, so I think there's sort of, and, uh, and I think, think about that. So think about a phrase like making money. You know, you can have the good, the bad, and the lucky. 
in terms of making money. Think about the money that you earn versus, say, money you might win in a, a bet or win, I say, in a lottery. When we think about making money, you might think about people speculating on the pound. George Soros made a lot of money. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? We differentiate between those two sources of income. We, you know, ultimately, you ended up with a pile of things in a ledger in a bank. But the way we came about it actually matters to us. But we don't always differentiate that when we talk about money. And certainly banks don't. They, don't, yeah, they should care more where their money comes from. Um, HSBC got into a lot of trouble for not differentiating that enough in Mexico. Um, although it should have been flagged up a little bit because they had a design request in the Mexican banks for bigger teller windows because they couldn't get the suitcases of cash <laughs> through them. Um, Oddly, that didn't red flag in compliance, <laughs> and they got fined 350 million for laundering all of the drug money in Mexico for 10 years. Um, so, banks should care about where money comes from and how it's made. They pretend you don't need to care, and economists don't care. It's the neutral veil, it's the thing that allows transactions to be objective, and it's fundamentally not objective. Um, and I think one of, the, one of the ways to try and bring that to life, so um, if you read The Gift by Mouse, it kind of gives you an idea of actually how we think about value and therefore maybe it should make you think about money because if you think of the value of a gift, and you pay 30 pounds for a bunch of flowers and you take it to your mum in the hospital. You've made a gift, you've put the effort in, you brought the flowers and you give the flowers. Now in economics, it should be the same transaction if I bring in 30 pounds, same value. And I've tried that. <laughs> um, you know, and so it's not reversible. There's a process there where I spent the money in a particular way. I added value. In, in effect, that's a sort of form of profit, right? You've made a return there that's not, that's come from the process just by using money, just by spending money. And when you look at why, you know, we had the, the debate this week about Marmite. Why, why do we care whether it's Marmite or Vegemite? It's because Unilever have spent millions of pounds telling you things about Marmite that you place in a place of value in your head. When you buy Marmite, you're buying more than a spread made from yeast that you don't really want to think about too much. Um, you're buying Marmite. You're buying, in some cases, you're buying a mother's love. A lot of the people on Twitter are like, what am I going to do for my son? My mum my mum prefers a thirty quid. So how do you get around that? She doesn't like that she prefers thirty quid with the cash and hands and business. Exactly. That's so, so how it's going to be. Yeah. And so she's not yeah, she's valuing what money can produce. So so I don't want it just to produce flowers and a gift, I want it to do something or use it for some reason. So in general, economics ignores that element of the value of money. So it says there is no actual value in money. It's merely a measure. So having um, more, you know, sort of like having, having more money is like having more centimeters in your life. It doesn't make you any taller. Um, it's just ways of measuring and cutting up value in the world. So it therefore needs to be neutral. Um, fundamentally, our ideas of money don't really come from that. They come from trying to measure obligations to one another. They come from debts that we had either to our neighbours, to the state, usually in a form of tax. That's where money comes from. It doesn't come from barter and trade and exchange. It predates markets and barter. Um, so we're kind of force-fitting money into a way of thinking about the world, which is ultimately very individualistic and rational. And it's fundamentally money is social and quite often irrational. No, I really don't get that. The money predates barter, it's impossible. It does, because barter is something you need large-scale communities for. No, you don't, no. no. I, mean, I live in a, well, I live in two communities, one in uh, Stavery, just down the road, and one in South Asia. Mm. And both, a massive amount of barter goes on, but, and it's at the level where tiny, tiny little communities barter. I mean, so I don't understand the argument at all, then. Um, yeah, they basically, Money appeared at the time we started doing agriculture. Historically, money predates. Yeah. The barter predates money. No. The anthropology 
of this now is very clear, money predates barter. But conceptually, it's not possible. Well, this is your problem, right? You, you, it you're, is my problem, I agree. Yeah, but, yeah, but it's, so I'm saying, you, know, you read David Graeber, 5,000 Years of Debt, <laughs> and then you'll see the anthropology is clear. We've looked at it. Um, Sumerian um, civilizations, all the way back, money is based in debt. It was not a market exchange tool until later. So yes, barter was the way we were exchanging in markets. But you had to pay your taxes. And you paid your taxes to the temple. So there was a way of, it was a way of measuring your debt. I don't think the Olympic man in a cave was paying taxes to anybody. He was just surviving next to a fire and being killed by, you know, some of his titles. Now you had potlatch. Hmm? You had potlatch. All right. So potlatch is the way in which the strongest person redistributed their wealth. And that was measured in things. Okay. So you know, it, money is a measure in that sense. It's a, so you have to break away the assumption. The barter thought comes from Adam Smith, and he was wrong. He made it up on the basis of having met some tribes in Newfoundland that traded in fish. But they'd also got money. He didn't look at that, because he didn't view it as money as he understood it. He saw money by then, already in a developed economy, as cash. Money is not cash. That's merely currency. That's how, one of the ways that we allow money to transmit. You can create money in lots and lots of ways. Um, so, to take an example of that, so coming back to peer-to-peer -peer lending. So peer-to-peer -peer lending is based on a two and a half thousand year old idea of loans and debt. Um, so there was a theory in classical, you know, my, my degree is in classics, and at that point there was a big fight going on, exactly to your point about which came first, banking or the economy. You know, because Athens had a complex market economy with insurance, shipping, maritime trade, big economy, 250,000 citizens, it was a dominant force on the back of its trade. And the theory was it must have had a banking system. Because how else could you have trade and money and everything else? And there was no evidence of this banking system. So essentially, people made it up. They said, well, we, it wouldn't be there because oh, it would just be a building, it'd be a person sat on a bench. You know, it was people in the forum trading, whatever it was. They, they created an idea that the banking kind of rooted in democracy and those values. Actually, if you went to the law court speeches, you found that they had a system of lending and borrowing, it just didn't involve banks. Um, and the name for those loans were called koinonia, which means community in Greek. And there were two types of loans, loans between citizens, which did not charge interest. But those loans created an <coughs> obligation. The obligation was that at a future date, that citizen could come back to you and ask for a loan in return. Because what happened was you'd have a farmer on one side of the valley who would get a hailstorm and no crops. The guy on the other side of the valley was fine. He'd have all his olives. So he had money. He could lend stuff to his friend, but he had to kind of measure it in some form, so he measured it in currency. So that's koinonia, but then you also had loans which incurred interest, and that was when you were trading with, um, topically, metics, foreigners, people who lived in Athens and traded in Athens, um, and dealt with slaves. And you did that to symbolise the fact it was a loan. <clears throat> which doesn't necessarily make sense to us. We, we assume someone pays us money and we expect to pay it back. That's the sort of, we have a kind of moral driver to that. Go to Russia, make sure they know it's a loan because they will assume it's a gift. <laughs> it's a problem if you're in banking or credit cards. <laughs> you have to come and tell them you have to pay that back now because <laughs> they're like, oh, it's a gift. <laughs> it's very kind of you to give me that money because there was no, the 70 years of, capitalist ideology did not exist. Two generations, they forgot what loans were. So you have to re-educate people as to what, and we were essentially educating them in sort of neoliberal thought, but you had to re-educate people, otherwise they just walked off with the money and they didn't pay it back. The bad debt rates in Russia were like 90%. So that change was really quite rapid within that, that culture because they had so much other stuff they were changing in terms of their moralities. But money itself had become less important. It wasn't the thing that was driving their world. Um, they didn't actually have any money, and that's how they were defeated. So one of the things we sort of start to think about, therefore, in terms of abundance, is what's the purpose of money? 
So rather than starting from how do we make money, which is often the start of any kind of economic reform, we're not making enough, we need more growth, we need more X, start thinking about well, what are we using money for? So what's the purpose of money? Why do we need it? To your point, you know, could we just exist through barter? Why are we, why are we not just exchanging the things that we need, producing the stuff that we have locally and so on? And you see that in certain communities where there's a strong sense of community and trust with one another. And you see it in Ireland when they didn't have any money for nine months. In 1970, they had a banking strike. No money. Oh, in the sense there was no cash. There was no ATMs, you couldn't cash a cheque, you couldn't go in a bank for nine months. The economy continued on as normal because the banks became pubs and the publicans became the bank manager because the publican knew who paid for their drinks and who didn't. So he was a good judge of who was a good credit risk or not. So you'd ask the publican, should I give this guy a cheque? Or should I, sorry, should I accept a cheque from this guy? Is he good for his money? And the publican would say whether or what he was. So they did nine billion pounds of transactions. It took six months for the banks to cash all the cheques <laughs> when they got back to work. It functioned as a normal economy without any banking going on at all. So there was no, you know, so in other words, money is what you make it. You know, we can create money to work the way we want it to. And it will fit in with the social norms that we have. So we don't necessarily have to conform to norms of money that don't fit with our values. And that's very much where alternative finance comes in. With alternative finance, and this we slowly, I think, even getting this into the heads of the people inside the Bank of England, who have perhaps <coughs> the most abstract perspective on money of anybody that you meet, is that we're producing money in a different way. And that's a good thing. Um, coming back to Zoe Williams, she was quite famous, uh, sort of, she was sort of laughed at in, I think it was a question time, on BBC, she said, someone said, there is no magic money tree. And unfortunately, she'd been talking to me at lunchtime and we'd had a few glasses of wine. And I said, had, had said to her, there is a magic money tree, it's called the Bank of England, right? It's true, right? They can make as much money as they want. They can make infinite amounts of money. It is a magic money tree. We have a central bank. We are not dependent on the ECB. We're not dependent on the Fed. We have a central bank. We can make as much money as we need. So it's not true that there's not enough money. Um, but, but if they just they start making money like that, won't the value of the money go down? It could well do, but we've just dropped 15% on the value of the pound. The world didn't end. Okay, so, you know, we are, yes, it can. Is that a bad thing? So, it's bad for, for the economy as such. Well, what you're creating. If the value of the pound goes down. It could well be, but it, what you're creating is more centimetres, right? I'm, I'm having to divide up the amount of stuff we have between more money. So that creates all sorts of problems. But that's not necessarily a bad thing. It's just that people who hold debt hate it. Because okay? if you get inflation, you devalue debt. So the people who ha hate inflation are the people who hold bonds. And the people who hold bonds are banks in the main. You used to be able to invest into a government bonds, and then they moved the denomination up to a thousand pounds, and people stopped doing it. Um, there were some good currency reasons for doing that, but one of the problems was that you, we no longer invest in our own government debt, except through national savings. So we're disconnected from that world. It is other people who hold those bonds. You have them in your annuities inside your pensions, but at a remove. You have no view on the value of them. You can't change the value. So we're rather disconnected from our government spending because most of our government spending is in the form of debt. So it is, we're in a diff that's a difficult place where the people who control effectively government spending are telling the government that their bank should not produce more money because it will devalue the debts that they hold. The reason why people, the baby boomers are so well off is not really because of the house prices going up, although it has an effect. It's the fact that their debts devalued rapidly in the 70s. In a 15% inflation, your debt is going down by 15% a year. That's like getting a pay rise every year <laughs> if you're in debt. So we sort of assume certain things about the world are good and bad, particularly around the word debt, which I'll, I'll come back to in a minute. Um, 
So, so coming back to the Zopa idea then, so we're looking at, so could we create a world where we don't use banks to lend and borrow money? That was the essay question that created Zopa. What does that world look like? And at the time, this is sort of 2003, so um, sometimes I have audiences where I say the words MySpace and they don't even know what I mean. Facebook did not exist in mm. 2003. Um, networks, the biggest network on the planet then was eBay. Um, and so we based Zopa on eBay. We said, people are trading, to your point around barter, people are trading with one another as strangers who aren't strangers on a marketplace successfully doing 30 billion a year at that point. We think we can do the same with money. And in economic terms, that shouldn't work because you'll maximize, you'll free ride, you'll do all the things that economics says happens around money, and it won't work. And the reality, the reality now is that it has. So Zopa has consistently lent money for 12 years now, had a lower bad debt rate than any bank in the world, less than 0.1%. So in terms of a way of sustainably lending and borrowing money between individuals, it has beaten the banks. And it's beaten the banks because it doesn't assume that money works the way the banks use it. Mm -hmm. So that creation, if you like, is, is sort of a, an example. So when people say, will you replace the banks? It's sort of a non-question. We're not banks. Banks can trade and do whatever it is they want. They create value in their own way. But what we're doing is allowing people to lend and borrow money with one another. That's not banking. Except in Germany, where they decided to regulate it that way, which is just a very strange decision. Um, which is why they don't have peer-to-peer lending in Germany. Because you have to have a banking license. Um, so, I think if you want to come back to that, then you sort of... If you think about a world, we could imagine a world maybe, therefore, without banking. What would that be like? What would banking, removal of banking, do to our economy? Would we have less money? Well, on that side, yes, because banks produce an awful lot of money. They produce money by lending it to people. Mm. And they lend more money than they have. And that's why we have to regulate banks so carefully, because the temptation is to lend out lots of money, because that's very profitable, and then not care too much about whether or not it gets paid back because you've already made your cash handing it out. Because the best time to ask someone for a fee is when you've just given them lots of money. And that's why we're prepared to pay fees on mortgages and pay fees on things, because we've been given what we perceive to be cash. At that point, you feel rich. In reality, you're not, you're in debt. But at that point, you feel good, you feel rich. That's the time I tap you up for 1,500 quid to have that mortgage. So. The banks had a wrong incentive there. They had no incentive in the payment back of that mortgage because that was on deposit holders and bond holders and governments. No incentive at all to pay the money back. They didn't care because they made all their money by giving it away. Sort of a reverse charity. <laughs> so, not surprisingly, that system blew itself up because all its incentives were aligned towards blowing it up. And if you worked inside banks, you could watch it happening. Um, and when you pointed that out, you got shouted at. <laughs> um, but then anthropologists have always had the, the, the sort of annoying thing of talking truth to power. <laughs> um, that's what we're supposed to do. Um, and I tried doing it with people like Andy Hornby and he didn't want to listen. Um, so if you think about money, I think, think about a different way. So coming back to this, the, the example of flowers. So um, think about coffee. Okay, so um, I used to work with Nestle. Uh, I used to work on their coffee brands, Nescafe coffee brands, trying to understand people drinking coffee. And I had a presentation from Nescafe that said, proudly, the maximum value that we think we can extract from a cup of coffee is seven cents. Seven. That's the maximum we think you can extract. So the perfect coffee in the world is instant coffee. It's the best coffee. I know we create all this hipster nonsense around lattes. And the best coffee in the world, if you do a blind taste test, is you'll choose the instant because it's the best made. Freeze dried coffee is the best made coffee. It captures exactly what you need. Um, so they thought that was the epitome of where coffee was going to be. This is, this is three years before the launch of Starbucks. 
Now, what's the maximum value you can extract from a cup of coffee? Yeah. <laughs> it's five bucks. <laughs> okay. So, and it's not even coffee. It's milk with some brown stuff in it. So, but what are you paying for? Why is, why have suddenly we moved from a well, you're all rational apparently, right? Okay. So you are paying seven cents a cup. Seven, now you want to pay three dollars, four pounds for pumpkin spice lattes. Why are you doing that? It's crazy. Brand value. There we go. So, but why is, you know, that's not a rational transaction. What am I getting for that? that what am, what in, why are you paying intangible value? Surely money is only for the tangible stuff. So well, it's a commodity. I'm exchanging a commodity with you. We have an objective view of the same value, and yet you're willing to give me all that cash for, for a comfy armchair and a sense of home in a, in a world that doesn't have much. So, so but Nescafe didn't see that coming because they went and rationalized their product as a commodity. They looked at how they could make it the best quality commodity they could possibly do. And then they didn't realize that wasn't the value of what they did. And I think you can look at that in terms of, think about now how you're spending your money. And when we talk about, and it's a moral question, right? People, quite often people without money are the ones we vilify for wasting it. You know, they spend it, they spend all their money. So, as an anthropologist, I've worked a lot with people who live in that space, as they're called problem families. And one of my jobs was to break that phrase um, by living with people and saying, right, this is what you mean by a problem family. A problem family, actually, was defined by the number of social workers that were involved with it. It was a problem, because if you made it a problem, I could apply services to it. <laughs> but when you went into their lives, their problem was not that. Their problem was that they didn't know where their money was coming from. They had no certainty in their lives. Their money was the least certain of anybody's. The only people who I found who spend money like problem families are traders on a, in a bank. They have more similarities in their money behaviour with traders in a bank than they have with families. And they're the two people who don't know where their money is coming from. Because a trader can lose their job in an instant, they can get or not get their bonus in an instant. But every banker I know, and what drives the desire for banking bonuses, is hugely in debt by the end of their year. Because they get all their money in one lump, but they spend it during the year on the basis they're going to get their bonus. And that's why they get so upset and change jobs when they don't get what they expected, because they've already spent it. Um, it's because they don't earn the money in that first year. They're told they need to get all this stuff to be part of the group, buy the nice car, buy the nice house, have all the lifestyle, the holidays. You'll make it back on the bonus. They're exactly like the problem families. The difference with problem families was that their money could be clawed back at any instant. Tax credits could be taken off you in retrospect. So imagine someone saying, you know, I paid you 50,000 pounds this year for your salary. We got it wrong, it should have been 40. I want 10,000 back now, with four weeks notice. Well, that's their life. So not surprisingly, they spend everything they've got, the instant they've got it, so they don't have to give it back. Their money went through them like water. And it was perfectly rational response to the way that money had meaning in their life. Money was fundamentally uncertain. So when someone who had certain money, someone with a defined benefit um, pension scheme and an annual salary and job security was telling them that they needed to manage their money better, not surprisingly, they didn't listen. Because you weren't talking in the same, it was like a bank manager talking to you about the fact that you don't really need that loan, do you? You don't need that new kitchen. I don't think you can afford it. So, these judgments sort of come in and they start to create social problems because we don't have the same perception of money. So this is, this is an issue when we're talking about something like sustainability because sustainability is about the long term. Now, how many of you feel like you've successfully saved for the long term, that you're doing that now? 
to you. You have your money in the future, so you're quite organised. People with their money in a sort of vaguely, in a vaguely organised space usually feel like they're doing something about their money. Um, yeah. Since you are talking about sustainability and money lending yeah. and banking, what do you think about factoring? Since two billion every year is trading through third party, hmm. through factoring, and especially after the recession and the complexity of uh, of uh, the lending process and the long process, so people are going towards uh, more to factoring mm. for short period of time and they are gaining the territory. Um, yeah, although it's not banks that are driving factoring because they don't like it. No, 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 no banks, banks. Banks. Yeah, so it, it, but that's driven by big companies. Um, so what we've got is a concentration of power within certain supply chains. So for me, the, the amount of factoring is a pretty good signifier there's a monopoly somewhere. Um, and I don't necessarily, because uh, there, there's people able to both apply price pressure, but also credit pressure on suppliers. So um, the fact that we only have four supermarkets really in the UK is a factor in, are oh, we have an invoice trading market now that's exploding? Because they push all the credit terms down onto the small businesses, and then the small businesses use the invoice factoring to stay alive. So and for those of you who don't know what invoice factoring is, it is basically you can sell your invoice if it's got a blue chip company's name on it. So if you've invoiced Tesco's, they're probably not going to pay you for six months. That's their normal terms. They're illegal, but that's their normal terms. And no one complains because every, what are you going to do? Um, so they're creating credit in the economy. So when small businesses say they're not borrowing enough, actually they're doing the opposite. They're lending money to Tesco's, huge amounts of it. So invoice factoring is a way of those companies actually having some cash flow, so they bring money into their businesses to exist. So you sell your invoice at a slight discount, and the person buying your invoice has got capital, and they can afford to sit on it for a while and wait for Tesco's to pay. So they take the payment from Tesco's. So the business gets the cash within 10 days, and Tesco's pays on six, six months. So in a way, it supports an unfair system. Um, but it is a reality in the majority of supply chains, in particularly in the UK and other European countries. You have very strong, powerful people at the top of the supply chain who impose terms down the supply chain that get worse and worse as you go down. If you did that for a small business, it has no power. So you, you've, got a, you know, you've got asymmetries there of power, and that means that you know, they will be they will, the creditors to the Tesco's, not the other way around. So it's, for me, that's yeah, it's an example of a system that's broken. Um, but there is a, you know, and then that's an interesting, that's part of peer-to-peer -peer lending now has become, you can invest in invoice financing. Um, that's been opened up to the market. What's been interesting about that has made people realise just how much there is of it. Because banks kept very quiet about it. It was quite a nice line of business for them, but they didn't shout about it too much. Because um, then they could charge more for it. Um, the invoice factoring guys have come in now and cut their margins in half. Um, and that's been quite interesting, the way banks have responded to that. That was the first time, I think, that banks realised that maybe peer-to-peer -peer lending was going to eat their lunch. So up until that point, they hadn't worried about Zopa and the other guys because we tended to loan small amounts to people that they would also lend to, but a bank lending 5,000 isn't interesting. A bank wants to lend you 10,000 because it can charge them for it. So it wasn't eating their lunch, but invoice factoring certainly did. Uh, anyone in yeah. Tell me if I'm not no, don't worry, it's fine. Um, you, you mentioned you, you spent time mm. studying those who are called problem families, and I just wonder as an anthropologist to believe that the welfare state has helped or harmed their economic prospects. Um, it was a slightly more complex story. So it's there are, what we saw was a dependency relationship. The services, and that's not necessarily the same thing as the welfare state, because I don't think that really existed. We had a fragmented set of often privatised services, often businesses, who were dealing with problem families. Um, the maximum number of agencies involved with one family was 28. Um, and, which is, at one level, quite a problem family. 
Um, but there was no sense of that person being seen as an individual. They all had their own perspective on it. So what you had was someone who had to deal with 28 different people who all had 28 different perspectives on them, who all had 28 different solutions for what she needed to do. And she did none of them as a result because she didn't know who she was really talking to. No one, in her view, was on her side. Um, actually, it was the 29th agency who was sort of on her side because I realised <laughs> I was sitting just what the hell was going on and said, you do know she's sitting in meetings with 28 people. Is that a good thing? Um, and also talked to the so social workers and said, how much is this about you feeling you want to be involved in her problem and how much is this about solving it? Because to a certain extent, people become dependent on the existence of problems. If, so, because their goals and objectives weren't set correctly. Their goals and objectives were about managing the problem families. They had no goals and objectives about making them no longer problem families. Mm -hmm. So, but you can only really see that if you were in and experiencing it for yourself. So you had to be in the home. Um, and interestingly, none of those agencies had any time to be in the actual homes. So maximum stay visits would be 15 minutes. You have to be there for six hours to understand. You have to be there for a reasonable length of time. You have to be there after dark. You have to be there when the children came home. You had to experience their lives in lots more ways. They didn't have time to do that. So they weren't able to do their jobs. But I think that's much more saying, well, what are you trying to create out of those problem families? What are you actually trying to do? And of course, the, the narrative was that these people are not productive. They're costing us money. So the whole narrative around problem families was not <coughs> someone with mental health problems, someone who had abusive relationships, someone who had um, extreme difficulties dealing with their family or with their children, or mental health problems amongst their children or special needs. It was all about how they weren't productive individuals. Because we'd reduced the role of the welfare state to being make them productive again, get them back on the production line. We don't value the other things that you do the fact that you're looking after a child with special needs, for example, um, and that you've got no economic resources to do that. And there was some irony in that, because of course David Cameron, who read that report, had a child with special education needs, special needs, and had spent a lot of money to make his house work. Wasn't prepared to have the state do the same for someone who didn't have his resources, and was willing to judge that person as non-productive. So money's hugely moral and hugely, therefore, social. And yet we allow a group of people who don't treat it as such to decide how it's going to work. And this is very important because banks and economists are reliant on this. It's a really difficult group to break down. You get scepticism at every stage. Um, the only time when we've broken that was that the Bank of England had an open day quite unusual. They wanted to talk to people. <laughs> and they had all sorts of people in the rooms of the society, they had peer-to-peer -peer vendors and everyone else, and they'd had this, because it's the Bank of England, they got seemingly a huge budget, everybody had an iPad. And you could ask questions using your iPad. And because the peer-to-peer -peer guys know how the internet works, we got all our questions up first. So the whole day was about peer-to-peer -peer learning and alternative finance. <laughs> because every time they looked at the questions, there was 10 from alternative finance people <laughs> before the others had worked out where control or delete was. <laughs> so we hijacked the whole day. <laughs> it was sort of, there was an irony and also about technology in there somewhere, yeah. and disruption. You know, of course we were going to disrupt the day. Um, and in the end, they had, to, they had to acknowledge that maybe they needed to look at this, but only because we made our voices heard and said, look, the way you're thinking about money, it drives us down particular routes. It isn't, you cannot just be, we're the Bank of England and we don't make political decisions. Every time you choose to use your money, you're making a political decision. And this comes back to, you know, do you invest in sustainability? Do you make that choice or not? It's a political choice. Um, it is not a straightforward economic one, because there's no such thing as a straightforward economic choice. You, know, you are choosing to produce one thing rather than producing another outcome. And those two things are not equal, even if they produce the same value in money terms. 
And so that's quite a challenge, because if I'm marketing financial services, I'm regulated in the way I can talk about it. So I talk about my investments. Um, if you invest with abundance, you can earn a return on your money. It's a commercial rate of return. It's just 6%, 7%, 9% .9 over a long period of time. It isn't why people buy, because if it's just about that, you might as well invest in anything. You might as well invest in an oil well. So what else are you investing in? What other value are you looking for from that investment? I can't talk about that very easily in the current regulation. It's not part of your decision process. If I'm audited by the regulator, they want to know, you know did I give you advice, which I'm not allowed to do? Did I recommend something over something else to you? without really assessing your needs and getting into your world of money. If I do that, I have to become a financial advisor. So I have to do it in a way that you make the choice for yourself. And in doing so, give you different sort of forms of information that allow you to make those decisions with your money. And I had um, quite a strong pushback on this by a regulator from Canada. He was like, that, he was like the next Mark Carney. <laughs> and he said to me, but, so what you're saying is that people are irrational with their money. So surely that means we shouldn't allow them to invest. That was his... So, because I'm rational with money, he said, I know what I'm doing with money. And I was like, well, okay. So did you invest into the UK <laughs> banking system in 2007, for example? Um, you know, did you decide to buy shares in Facebook just before the IPO? Because um, you would have done those for rational reasons, but you would have been wrong. And I think, you know, a lot of the times when I talk to people who say they're very rational about money and we do that room thing, and I talk to someone maybe who's not an accountant, accountants are incredibly irrational with money, but um, someone who's a, an investment person, um, their, their view of money will quite often be quite conventional in terms of symbols, so cash, piles of money, maybe a safe, a bank. Um, but then when you talk about their investments, you realise that 99% of the way they organise their money is a post-rationalisation. They don't have an investment strategy. They're not... The people who have investment strategies, they're the, guy, they're the hedge funds. And those guys are just weird and geeky. <laughs> they are not everybody. In fact, they're not anybody that you meet. Um, they're the guys who see something that's not working. And that's what the big short's about. It's about guys who saw things that weren't working in the economy, who actually saw before Greenspan that markets don't work unless you make them work. That you can't just leave them to it. If you leave them to it, they create all sorts of weird stuff. And that's what the Big Short's about. The Big Short is about a massive bet on it not working. Just as Soros made his money on a massive bet that politicians would step in against their rational judgment, that they politically couldn't let the pound fall. He made a billion of that. That's not rational. That's not market economics. That's just a straightforward game of poker. <laughs> so if that's really how the financial system is working, a million games of poker being played out by very fast computers, why do we think that's going to produce any sort of long-term value? You know, if we think that's how financial systems should be, if that's where we're moving it towards, then you know, you're better off reading, reading Zayek or you know, sort of to understand a game of poker than you are reading Hayek. Because it's not like that. It isn't people assessing their needs rationally, walking into a marketplace, fulfilling those needs and walking out again on an individual basis, and the invisible hand brings it all together. It's just not how it works. And there's enough anthropologists now who sort of sit in financial markets and say, right, OK, I've now observed them. A lot of them are based on social networks, the eyeball rigging. <laughs> that was supposedly the, one of the best operating markets in the world, was setting the cost of money between banks. That should, have, that should be just perfectly rational. It wasn't. They rigged it. Because they're people. So we're kind of investing a lot of money and intellect into justifying a system that fundamentally does not work that way. There's too many uh, trading platforms on the internet uh, getting their license to trade doesn't mean that they are accountable 
for money, and they are registered here in the UK, mm. and there's a big conflict between the registration in Cyprus, Gibraltar, States, and Canada. Mm. Uh, and as you know, these platforms take the money in every single trade. You sell or you buy. Mm. But when you generate your money, they refuse to pay. So talking about the British regulation, how they allow such a platform to... Well, uh, yeah. uh, well that's Brexit, right? So yes. that's passporting. So, <laughs> yeah, it's we don't... 95% they don't pay back. And there is from 2010 yeah. to 2016, more than 300,000 cases in courts. And they said, oh, of course, they have a license. But license doesn't mean to pay the money back to investors. Hmm. Well, I, yeah, I, I would comment on individual cases like that because I'm regulated myself. Um, but the point there is, yeah, we don't have the same level of regulation everywhere. So all crowdfunders have to be regulated in the UK because the UK is the only country in the world with proper crowdfunding regulation. Anywhere else, they're doing it under a separate system. Um, so you do have recourse. Um, you have recourse to the ombudsman, up to £150,000. You do have protections. So no, you shouldn't go somewhere that's regulated out of Malta, for sure. Um, you should look where companies come from when you're looking about your money. It matters. Um, and the European Union's weakness is it doesn't have a single market for financial services. There isn't one. We're not leaving the single market for financial services. It was never existed. We have a sort of hodgepodge of agreements that are incredibly complex. Passporting is one element of it, which is a phrase you would have heard a lot. Banks saying, we're going to lose passporting. Um, it's only really important if you happen to trade in euro-denominated stocks and shares, which I'm guessing a lot of you do. <laughs> <laughs> but if you do that, you can't do it in London if we don't have passports in. So a lot of people who are paid to trade in euro denominated stocks will move to Madrid uh, or Frankfurt. But that's 25% of the city workforce, by the way. So, sorry. Um, so, 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 yeah, I agree that there's a lot of stuff which is unregulated that's sprung up. The solution to that is you don't regulate to stop things. That's not what the regulator's there to do. The regulator is there to promote good behaviour from financial services companies. That's how you create a sustainable market in financial services. So you have to come up with a system that's based on principles, not rules. Now, unfortunately, in, the, in Europe, you have two types of regulator, and they broadly coalesce around the UK, and then you have the, the German regulator, it's called the Baffin, and France, and then Eastern Europe, all kind of work in the same way. And it's to do with your code of law. If you have a code of law based on civil codes, i.e. rules, or do you have one based on principles? And the benefit thing in the UK is we never wrote down our constitution. It's all principles and precedent based, which means you can change it. But it also means you can establish principles about how you operate. So when we build a house in the UK, your responsibilities are it shouldn't fall down. If you build a house in Germany, they will, it might well fall down, but as long as you followed the code, you're not sued. <laughs> Okay, so they'll say how they want the walls to be, they'll say how exactly what thickness you have to do, what grade of concrete you have to use. If you don't do it very well, as long as you didn't break a code, you can't be sued. In the UK, you can. You have responsibility and you have accountability. So we have that in financial services, we have the equivalent of that. Whereas in, in Germany, if I want to be a financial service company, they will regulate me to the nth degree about how I work. And that was how we tried to regulate banks. And, and every time you do that, someone will innovate their way around it. So Zopa existed for eight years without being regulated. It created its own regulation. We asked the regulator to regulate us, um, which is a first. No financial services sector ever asked for regulation. But we did, because we understood what it means. It means building an industry, building a sustainable system, being part of that system, being part of law. That's how we make things work, being part of society. You can't hold things accountable if they're not in society. That's why shadow banking is so dangerous. That's why global and um, offshore banking is so dangerous. It's not in society. We don't control it. Why do we think that's a good thing? So these are the things which get in the way of then trying to make investments into good stuff. Because a lot of investing happens outside of the law. A lot of money moves outside of the law outside of any kind of purview. Um, and we seem accepting of that. But 
perhaps because we don't know the, the full extent of how it works, but it is one of the reasons why capital doesn't flow where it's needed, because we're allowing other people to make those decisions. So, you know, in a way, it's our own fault. In a democracy, it should not be possible to make investments that don't meet the needs of society. That's, democracy is about the checks and balances that make sure that any investment that made is for the greater good. Otherwise, what are we doing? And when you've got a society where the majority of things the government now does are not investing in it, that also means about us making decisions how that money is made. So one of the things we'll be launching on November the 1st is a Swindon ISA. Now, Swindon might not be the first place you think of if you're English of being the city. It is, they call themselves city of the future. They've always been city of the future since the 1970s. It was actually the first place that tried digital cash. Uh, Mondex was trialled in Swindon. Um, and Swindon is the average place in the UK. It's where the most average person actually lives. <laughs> they, they, they found it. Um, <laughs> narrowed it down, narrowed it down. There's a guy who has the 2.2 children um, and lives in a house that's the average size with the average car, the average car colour, right the way down. He lives in Swindon, he lives in the centre of Swindon. So it is like the, the, the omphalos, it's the, it's, the, it's the navel of the UK, basically. So it's a good place to start. <laughs> and in Swindon, they want to build 200 megawatts of so, uh, renewable energy, which is how much uh, electricity Swindon itself uses on an annual basis. Um, and they want to do that with solar, uh, with biomass, and with waste to heat. They built 167 megawatts, um, and they came to us because they wanted to do some more solar, but they didn't necessarily want to just do it themselves with their own money. So we brought £2 million from the community through our investment, through the venture, which is a bond, into a solar park. We built 5 megawatts of solar, and we're about to do another 5 megawatts and from November the 1st, that will be what is effectively a Swindon ISA. So you're saving for your future through something pretty normal in the UK, an ISA. Um, but it's directed into Swindon. So if you live in Swindon, you can say you've got a Swindon ISA. If you live somewhere else and you invest somewhere else, we'll call it something else. So there will be a Manchester ISA, there will be a Nottingham ISA, there will be a Bristol one, most certainly. Um, it will gravitate towards places, there might even be a Welsh one. Um, the Scots are kind of looking at this. So we're trying to change the dynamic. Now, there's always a bit of a pushback on that. So I'm still interested in your concept of money. And I think there's something happening here to do with you've got quite a focus on urban economy. It kind of loses out. It doesn't seem to work quite the same way rural economy is. I know you, you, mm. you say it does, but I'm not sure entirely that it does. I mean, say, like, how does you were thinking about my granddad who came from um, Northern Ireland, mm. you know, linked into potato famine famines. He came from Belfast, when he'd go to Stranded Arm, he went to Paul Patrick. And uh, he was Irish Catholic, and there's a very large community there. Mm. And when they actually move into the rural areas there, they, they, they're, not, they're not using money. Now, I don't know quite sure what's happening there. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. I mean, I, I read, the, my only reference to that was I read The Shepherd's Life. Recently, yeah. which I think yeah. is quite an interesting yeah. account of the industry of sheep and the different transactions that occurred there in the world, the role that money plays in enabling that, in enabling those livelihoods, but also there's other forms of exchange going on. And of course, there are. I think that. But again, the most powerful shepherd in that situation mm. had power because of um, state, you know, long-term status have been there the longest in the valley have done this for the longest so in a way it yep. gets to your thing but what my grandfather did though was he worked in pits <coughs> in Ireland. he worked in pits in Ayrshire and I've been into the one in Down Wellington what used to be the shop in Down Wellington and those miners weren't paid in money hmm. they were paid in tokens they can only use in the country shop yep. so there's a direct relationship to your neighbour to be but uh, but you're only not calling that money because it's not cash. That's money. No, no because they were not use those tokens anywhere else. It doesn't matter. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. It's still money. You know, it, it's just it's it's the only legal form of alternative currency you can have in the UK as a token. Right. Um, it has to be one to one convertible into a pound. So you know, Bristol pounds are not money because if they were, it would be illegal. 
And that's only because we put a particular legal definition around money as currency. Now, there's, that's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a really important reason for that, which is, and this is something that sort of occurred to me recently, is if, for example, I start doing things like funding schools or roads or hospitals with these types of investments, then that money is, those investments are effectively government backed because we'd be using government tax money to repay those investments. Okay, that's how private finance works. We could make that a fairer, more transparent system by bringing ordinary investors into the mix rather than the Bank of Tokyo, who does the majority of stuff at the moment. And when I do that with a five pound domination, there's a, there, is a, there is a scenario where the, the pound continues to drop like a rock and I'm paying for my cappuccinos in my debentures because they become fungible. They become something you're willing to exchange as value. And you, if you read the Backhop account of the Lombard Street crash, that was when credit notes issued by farmers became a currency and became speculated on as a commodity. Went up hugely in value, then they started underwriting bad debts and the whole lot crashed underneath them. And that was about the time when the Bank of England realized it had to step in on things. It couldn't just let things go. It was Norfolk farmers blew up the banking system. Um, so, in those contexts, we have to be sort of, that's why they're very careful about what money is. And in the US, where there were about 300 currencies prior to the Civil War, it became important because printing money was a way of fighting battles. <laughs> so controlling the money supply became about sovereign sovereignty. And so you've got a, it's a whole political system built around the idea that there's only one form of money. And I, from my perspective, I don't see why we shouldn't start disrupting that. <laughs> you see, you're being fair. And for my grandfather and for the people in Steinbeck Springs as well, when they were the Oki <coughs> in California, yeah. that wasn't a fair system. No, not at all. And people died, just as people died. Yeah, absolutely. So, and, but, but in Zimbabwe, right, it's, they, effectively the money was tokens if you tried to exchange it for dollars, because no one would take it, right? So, so yes, people starve when money collapses. So yes, we need to maintain value in money. What I'm saying is what produces the value of money is not what we've what we think it is, i.e. it's sitting in a bank. Sorry, the question there. Yeah, uh, you'll forgive me because my English is not very good. Okay. I'm just going to uh, check on my... I'm, I'm, I'm completely out of when but, we've got time uh, on as well. But so. let, me, let me try and build on what I'm hearing here. And I'll develop it as a concept. And I'll be a cycle for the purpose of this argument. Mm. That from the part of the world where I come from. Uh, when a woman says, I want a homestead, mm -hmm. and when a man says, I want a homestead, they mean two different concepts or two different things, both of which are diverging right. one way or the other. The, mm -hmm. the, the woman will talk about the attributes that are positive, and the men will be talking about the, the attributes that I think are negative. Mm -hmm. This is a product of the means of exchange called money. Because it perpetuates the oppression of women. Mm -hmm. Because if you then come up with money, you can possess, own, and control a woman. Yes. Yeah. And, and I think. We have, uh, you have yeah. a similar problem in the UK, but it's called the secret ISA problem. Yeah. So um, I would put quite a lot of money on, in most relationships within the first three years, that the woman does not reveal all the money that she has. Well, um, yeah, this, the, so this, you don't, this, you don't this. reveal your money because it gives power over that person, right? You know, so to your point around, that's why M-Pesa was so revolutionary in Kenya, which is it gave control over money back to the woman because the cash was arriving in a more controlled way from the person who was working in the city to where the woman was living in the country. So you had unforeseen social consequences of women taking control over that money and then investing it in businesses within the villages. So the villages' development went up because the women were using them, felt more control over the money, to your point. You know, the, the money had gone through an agent to get to them, rather than being handed by the husband or through actually a taxi driver, um, to get to them, and therefore they used it differently. 
and it started to free up the concepts. So the, 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 money, the, the concept of money changed from being about a sense of male and female oppression to being about investment and um, building a life. And that's why, you know, when you look at the microfinance, which, you know, they have their problems, they tend to lend money to women because they'll use it differently to the way that men will use it in certain cultures. And you definitely see that distinction. And it's not about a male-female biological thing. It's about culturally, how are you viewing the role of money in your life? But I would say that's not so different to here. I, I definitely saw, we, we, there's, a, you know, there's a phenomenon now in the UK, which is that in just over half of households, the woman is now the financial decision maker. That switch was about 2007. 56% of households, the woman is the financial decision maker. In the other 44% of decisions, she sets the choices. <laughs> so um, you think you're the financial decision maker, but you think where those choices came from for a minute there. And, and <laughs> so in other words, when banks talk about money in a male way, as they are in rather apt to do, they're not talking to a world of money that even exists outside of their bank, which is why when people say they don't like going into branches, it's because they don't feel it's the world of money that exists. Um, so, you know, we went through, I did a live experiment for this, we redesigned a branch so that it had none of the male cues to do with money, no pound symbols, no tables, like league tables of success or failure in terms of investment. Um, we had, it felt a bit like a kitchen and footfall within that branch went up by 30% because people wanted to go into a place where they felt comfortable talking about money, not in a place that made them feel uncomfortable talking about money because socially we were talking about two different perspectives. The power relationship reversed and there was no suits either in this bank, but it was still trusted. So all the things that, you know, ultimately what you realize is that banks, when they wear a suit, they build a big building with pillars, um, they're, they're compensating for something, right? <laughs> it's nothing to do with trust. When they say we're a trusted institution, that, or we worry about lots of trust, that's an insecurity statement. Um, so their own insecurity reinforces. Um, and it was very interesting in Russia when they tried to rebuild their banking system, they just looked at Western banks and just plonked them <laughs> onto their high street. It looked really strange. Um, Spobank in, in, in uh, Russia, they've got these huge, great columns outside, really trying to get you to trust them. <laughs> um, and and in, in, in Russia, some of those power dynamics do work, but only in, in a background where you have Putin as a dictator. So it is, <laughs> think, you know, think about how that makes your financial system work when you're, you're saying about powerful institutions should be running the money. I, I take the view that it should be the opposite. To your point about, you know, I'd rather have a thousand flowers bloom and they all have a different floor than have five large banks all with the same problem. Because that's the main reason why we haven't invested into renewables, transformation, green economy. It is not worth having that debate. You can talk about smart cities, um, sustainability goals, objectives, you want to be 100% green. It doesn't matter a damn if you haven't got the money to make it happen. If the money is over here doing something else, it's not going to happen. So unless you move that money to where it needs to be, it won't happen. And there seems to be a block. This is the thing that, is, as I said at the beginning, about talking to The Guardian about money. Talking about money and finance is somehow slightly dirty. Like I was, um, abundance makes a profit. That's a problem for community energy. You make a profit. I make a profit so I can invest in my business and grow it. Um, how big do you want to be? You know, how big do you want community energy to be? So there was a view that community energy shouldn't be bigger than a turbine, shouldn't be bigger than, bigger than the community that's trying to build it. Well, why not be a profitable community and export to the other community that can't be asked? Right? Cornwall, so we created a league table of <coughs> counties by, by the amount of energy they produce and created competition in Cornwall and Devon, who have to see really, really like each other. Um, as to who was best between those two. And then you look at somewhere like Wiltshire, uh, not Wiltshire, Hampshire, or, um, or you know, parts of Wiltshire, complete deserts. 
Now, it's two ways of approaching that. One is you say, you know, the money all went to where it could operate, and it avoided where it couldn't, where it was hard, because capital is lazy. It goes where it's easiest to make money. To make it go to where it needs to go, you have to do the hard stuff. And you know, abundance grows more slowly because it's difficult to get money into proper stuff. It's much easier and it's so tempting. You'll see something come by and you go, yeah, we could do that. We could put some money into that, that'll make an easy return, we get some growth, then we'll come back and do that thing we were supposed to be doing. And that's essentially the story of ethical investment. It's so much easier to do the easy thing. Um, and with money, it's really easy because you're not doing very much. You're just moving some zeros and ones from here and putting them over here. And in doing that, I then create outcomes, activity, production, stuff. So it's, how do you get the money to move to the sustainable green? Economy? Well, I guess that's my job. So we produce advertising and we, we've tried different forms of advertising. The most powerful one that we've found is to talk about the dual win-win. Because actually people, unless you're extremely wealthy and feel very philanthropic, people aren't doing this for the good of it. Right. They're doing it because their children want to go to university, they want to buy a house in the future, they want to <coughs> protect themselves against uh, an impoverished retirement. So unless you're achieving those outcomes with your money, I haven't got your attention. Because those are fundamental needs, and we cannot ignore them. So I have to offer that solution, which is why it's harder, and you're going to do it through producing an ethical outcome. So you will have to trade it off. So you need a specialist company. Well, which is what we are. This company will become big, and again, we will be in the same game. Well, that's the challenge, right? So can we scale that up and not lose our ethics? Right, that's a fair challenge. I'm, where I'm, I'm, we're running over, so... Well, it's fine. We, we've we kind of rolled into... the, the questions into the session, yes. so that's we're bang on time from that perspective. Um, I'm, I think what you've talked about, Bruce, has just been amazing. Mm. The thoughts and the connections, particularly for our group today, mm. I'm sure for everybody, are many and varied and I feel like we've only just scratched the surface and we could keep yeah, yeah. Well, standing here talking forever but I'd, I'd love to say a big thank you.